Hi, Misha here, and it's time for another collection overview video. And I considered just making this a two-parter, and then I said, screw it, let's go full motion picture length to cover the British Lee Enfield story. Pretty much from the beginning to the end. Hello, cat. <clears throat> and so we will start off with the earliest Lee Infields, including talking about the Lee Metfords. These would be the, the Long Lees, the M L E, the M Lees. And the carbines, the LECs, the Lex. Then we'll move into. See, told you, cat. They always like doing that. We'll move into the SMLEs, the Smellies. First with the Mark I, then into the Mark Three, And then we will progress to the kind of odd man out in the group the pattern 1914 the P14 so called infield and then we'll pick back up with World War 1 going through the mark 3 star and from there we will have our first intermission. So with that, let's go back to the 19th century, the time of empire. And the time really still under Queen Victoria when the British were at the top of their game. And after using single shot black powder guns like the Martini Henry and some rolling block types they were needing a modern cutting edge small diameter bore magazine fed so repeating long arm and carbine for their various military forces and these would have to serve not, of course, just in England, but in Africa and India and elsewhere. Because back then, the sun truly never set on the British Empire. Alright, we'll begin with the oldest. Actually, this is not the oldest I lie, but nearly the oldest one I have. This is my magazine. Lee Enfield Mark One. But before we talk about it, let's talk about its immediate predecessor, the magazine Lee Metford, shortened to MLM. Not not that MLM that you think of today, but the the British MLM. In the 1880s, much like everyone else, Britain was going to new technology and James Paris Lee was at the forefront of a lot of it and he did a lot of work with magazines as well as other things including bolt systems he had already had quite a bit of success and so his attention was turned to the British now in 1885 the development was ongoing for what would become the Lee Medford. Black powder was still the same. At most, you had compressed black powder flakes, sometimes referred to as semi-smokeless later on, that predated cordite. So they were designing a new small bore cartridge for the best black powder they had at the time. This would have been a three. 03 caliber, 7.7 millimeter, a rimmed round, round nose bullet, pretty standard for the day and time. 
and the rifle was de designed around this. And it used Lee's bolt system that locked in the rear with a pretty short throw. And it used a Lee magazine. Originally not this one. It used an 8 round essentially single stack or at least single feed type mag. The rifling was actually designed by a gentleman named William Metford. And it was given a very shallow groove to better work with black powder, or rather, to better be cleaned easily, not leaving you know, little nooks and crannies. Actually not a bad idea for black powder. And black powder was relatively cool burning compared to what would come later, and also the rounds were coming at it at a much more sedate velocity. So it was a good idea. There was another gentleman involved that you don't hear as much about, Joseph Speed. He designed a magazine feed cutoff to go with Lee's magazine. He also designed a top cover or dust cover for the bolt that you wouldn't have to manually manipulate like on Arasaka's. It could uh, just move with the bolt. He did a few things too, including work on sights. But those are the three principal designers with many others contributing. So the gun was pretty well done, ready to go, and then France dropped their bombshell while the Le Bell rifle, the 1886, was honestly less advanced than this one here, the 8mm Le Bell cartridge, thanks to its early smokeless powder, was just better. Now luckily, and maybe not luckily, mostly luckily frankly, the Brits had not adopted this rifle yet. So they went back and did a few changes, namely to the cartridge, and filled it with early smokeless, early cordite powder, and the Lee action was strong enough to handle it. So with that, in 1888, the Lee Metford Mark I was adopted and was put into full production and service. It was very similar to this gun with the long 31 inch barrel, very slender stock. It actually had a safety in the rear quite similar to the very later guns, you know, mounted on the receiver. It also had different style of sights. Next to come, at the very beginning of 1892, was the Lee Metford Mark I Star, which went to an updated sight pattern. And only about two weeks after it was adopted, the Metford Mark II was adopted. And the big deal with the Mark II, it went to this pattern of magazine you're familiar with. The 10 round detaching Lee Mag. So two more rounds and it was a double feed style. Let's see if I can shake this out. Now, as you'll notice with any of these early ones, these were chained to the gun. And that was a bit of a compromise because people were very, very worried about this radical high capacity detaching feed clip. Yeah, it was over a hundred years ago. It wasn't even in this country and it was a concern. So the chain was kind of a compromise, as was the magazine feed cutoff up here. People were worried, of course, soldiers would waste ammo. It's hard to guide this in single-handed, so I won't. We'll just let it dangle. And they were also worried, of course, soldiers would lose their magazine. So what they would do, they would have this one chained to the gun, and then they would keep a spare mag in their pocket, either for rapid reloading or in case this mag was lost or damaged. But normally you would have your feed cut off in the inner position as it is here for single shot. Only if a higher up told you to flip it out and go full 10 rounds, would you? It's a pretty common concept for that era. 
So that was the Lee Metford Mark II. And they were pretty happy with it. But in early 1895, they would go to the Lee Metford Mark II Star, which would introduce this pattern of safety located on the bolt knob, the cocking piece. Originally, the safety was receiver mounted. Then they would actually go to a version without it for a while, and then they would go to this, which we'll talk about why with the next gun. Interestingly, this already had the turned down bolt. Pretty forward thinking for that time, perhaps. But there was already trouble in paradise. While the Lee action was strong enough to handle a 303 with smokeless powder, that Medford rifling just was not. Those shallow grooves that did so well for cleaning with black powder wore away very rapidly with smokeless. We're talking 5,000 rounds. In other words, one of these would be approaching a smooth bore if you got it to the Rob Ski test. This obviously was not acceptable. But the Royal Small Arms factory at Enfield came up with a new pattern of rifling that was much sharper, stronger, and could take the heat, velocity, pressure, wear and tear of smokeless, and thus the magazine Lee Enfield Mark I was born. It was adopted at the end of 19, excuse me, 1895 basically going into production the following year. And the Lee Enfield Mark I Star would be adopted in 1899 when they would go away from this uh, rod under the barrel. That rod is not a cleaning rod, it's a clearing rod in case something is stuck in the barrel. It was definitely a holdover from the black powder days when that was much more a problem. Even a bit of a holdover to the musket days when you needed a packing rod. But they would do away with it in the 20th century, instead storing all their cleaning gear in a trapdoor in the buttstock, a much more modern method. But all wasn't well with the earliest infields, either. Britain had an empire, so the Metfords had been used in small skirmishes in Africa and India. But the first major conflict these were used in was the Boer War, 1899-1900, that time period. And the troops that were originally down there in South Africa had the older Lee Excuse me. Yeah, Lee Medfords. Of course, they were shooting the barrels out quite quickly. And new troops, refreshments, uh, replacements, reinforcements, were coming in with the brand spanking new Lee Enfield. And they very quickly determined that going to the new rifling and... Britain had also tinkered with the cartridge. They would have several marks of the 303 cartridge. The Hague Convention would actually ch force them to change. So between changing of the cartridge loading and the rifling, they discovered that the sights were way, way off. Like a foot and a half off. Thus, they would have to recalibrate, or at least use Kentucky windage to get these things to hit on target at all. But the good news is the new rifling was standing up pretty well. So looking at it, like I said, we have a rod under the barrel here on the early ones. We have this old school style bayonet lug, unprotected front sight, a very unprotected barrel except for a very small handguard behind the rear sight. Very old school style rear sights. We have these volley sights, little dial here, you dial the range in, 
with. Press it down when not in use. And that works with a flip up and otherwise fixed rear volley. And volley fire is kind of mocked today. But it was really not a bad concept and even occasionally useful. In the 1890s, this smokeless thing was all brand new. Having rifles able to shoot, at least on paper, out to 2,000 yards was a new concept. But they weren't stupid. They knew that the, the soldiers individually couldn't see that far. But the idea was if you collected several of them, perhaps several hundred, and then gave them volley sights and had them volley shoot, you would rain down kind of a mini artillery barrage in a general area. And if you have hundreds, maybe thousands of bullets falling in the same area, like heavy rain, talk about uh, acid rain, right? You might hit something, or at least scare the shit out of your opponents. And I agree. <laughs> and this concept would be carried on for quite some time. Like I said, we have a pretty neat top cover, dust cover on these. We have the cutoff. We have a turned down bolt handle, which is considered a pretty modern feature. The magazine is also modern. We have a ribbed trigger for better grip. And we have a very distinctive semi pistol grip buttstock. Sling swivel here in the back. Didn't have a swivel up here yet. Have a front swivel here. And we can have a stacking swivel. Stacking rod for the TP up here. So, honestly, while the cartridge was maybe a bit traditional, the rifle itself was, was pretty modern, frankly. At least by that standard of the late 19th, earliest 20th century. And also by the standard of the time, you would adopt a long rifle for infantry. But other troops would need something other Following the trends of the time, they adopted a carbine with a barrel about a foot shorter than the rifle. And as with many carbines of that era, it um, did not have a bayonet lug. It was just designed to be slim and compact. It was Primarily designed for cavalry, although other specialists like artillery or messengers or what have you could be issued these. This is probably my oldest one because this still has the old school Lee Medford rifling in it. The MLMC or just LMC Mark I carbine wasn't adopted until 1894, so towards the end of Metford production. So they only made a few up until about 1896. Then that would transition over to the Lee Enfield Carbine, the LEC, or the LEC Mark I. And as with other guns, in 1899 they would lose their, uh, lose their stuffing rod in, under the barrel. So what do we have here? Well, the butt is pretty similar, except no sling swivel on the bottom. We have a smaller six round mag, but it's still chained. Still have a top cover. Our rear sight is actually protected by a leather cover. No front swivel here. Full length, or at least nearly so, upper handguard. It ends behind the rear sight. We have a protected front sight with little ears. And everything was done to kind of make this as round and 
not catch on stuff as possible. Hence why we have a protector for the rear sight. It unbuttons and then you can rotate it around and rebutton it on the bottom. We still have a uh, feed cutoff. We have a very turned down bolt now. This bolt is just right up against the receiver and flattened to boot. And here's the safety. And this is interesting because this cocking piece safety was originally a unique feature of the carbine. But I guess they liked it so much that they transitioned it over to the later Lee Medfords and the early Enfields. Guess why not? Now you haven't seen much evidence of uh, sling mounts. The only one on this gun is this small swivel inlet into the stock in the back. These guns are a good bit shorter and quite a bit lighter than the full size and they are very rounded. There are not any sharp edges to catch on things. So at first cavalry really liked them until they went to war with them in the Boer War. First Medford's later infield rifled. They very quickly di discovered that they had limited range and that their enemies could simply sit outside the range of these little carbines and pick them off with, uh, to be fair, pretty lucky shots, but because we're talking at over a thousand yards, still they could do it. Therefore, some of the carbines in that war would be traded in for regular rifles. I guess if it's between carrying a long and heavy gun that you can actually use and feel confident in versus a light and trim gun that you're worried will get you killed, the, the choice is pretty straightforward. Therefore, Lee carbine production was pretty limited. I honestly don't know how many were made. For the long rifles, kind of looking at all versions and stuff, it seems like around a million, all told. But it's kind of hard to get numbers because they would rebuild and rework and reclassify these time and time again. So, for example, some older Lee Medfords would be rebuilt into training rifles. Some would be given uh, charger guides. If you notice, neither of these have provisions to take chargers, a.k.a. stripper clips. It wasn't until the 20th century they started trying to make that work with these. So some would be upgraded to what they called the C-L-E-L-L-E. -E -L 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 -E. And in this case, C-L-L-E-C. The names start to get pretty confusing. They haven't really gone Mark crazy yet. Most of them are still just Mark 1 or Mark 2. But they started adding a lot of stars. And you also start seeing things like the IP, the India pattern. Yeah. And some variations start to grow out after the beginning of the 20th century. And one popular thing to do with the carbine was to give it a bayonet lug. So just because these maybe didn't have the range and accuracy that soldiers out in the field would want, doesn't mean that maybe soldiers stationed in urban environments or more likely police wouldn't find it useful. Around 1901, the first contract for this, the so-called New Zealand Carbine for a thousand units was placed and then a second contract for 500 came around 1903-1904. And basically it's the same gun with a bayonet lug and you'll notice it doesn't have a hole for the rod now. Moving back here, we no longer have the sight cover still have the little short mag, still have the feed cut off, still have the dust cover, still have the very flat bolt, but we finally do get sling swivels, again because these are really not intended for cavalry. Swivel up here, so 
like there. And these are purpose-built, but interestingly, the barrels in them were actually from Martini Henry carbines. So they're actually a little thicker, a little heavier. But only about 1500 these were made. The more famous carbine came about in 1904, the Royal Irish Constabulary, RIC, R-I-C, carbine. Between that year and about 1914, so the beginning of World War I, they would send in older carbines, paying for them themselves out of police funds or what have you, constabulary funds, and uh, British arsenals would rebuild them into something very close to this. They would uh, rework the forestock, install a lug, but since they had the original barrel, they actually had to make it a little bit fatter on the end. It's kind of interesting when you see one. And they have that telltale splice in the stock. These are more famous. They're also more common. They would convert around 11,200 over that 10-year period. So, you know, only about 1,100 a year if they did them on an average term, which I'm sure they didn't still yet. Yeah, but just goes to show you that uh, they did do some variations. But really, the Boer War spelled the end for both the carbine and the long rifle. Britain realized that carbines were too short and they needed the range and accuracy of a rifle. So they started experimenting to see just how short of a rifle they could build without compromising too much range, accuracy, and for that matter flash and noise. And that gets us in to the next program in the infield I'm sure most of you are very familiar with. The short magazine Lee Enfield S-M-L-E or sometimes it was abbreviated S-H-T for short L-E and this is the original Mark one, well, almost. As early as 1901, work on an intermediate length rifle had begun with even some early testing of cut down models. <clears throat> the original rifle had about a 30 and a quarter inch barrel about 49 and a half inches long. The carbine had about a 21 and a quarter inch barrel, although that would vary a bit depending on bayonet or no bayonet, and had an overall length of about 40 and a half inches. It would weigh seven some odd pounds with the rifle weighing nine some odd pounds. What they designed was really just splitting it down the middle. They went to a 25 and a quarter inch barrel which gave it an overall length of 44 and a half inches and a weight in the eight some odd pounds range. The reason I'm not being very specific about weight is it's very variant dependent, also configuration and even type of wood. It can fluctuate by several ounces because there are so many styles of these. They also went to an early charger form here where the guide was built in to the bolt head here.
two-piece setup. There's a notch in the receiver that's fixed, and then this moves. And you use your charger there. You still have a mag cutoff, and there is no hold-open device. So you can easily close it because it is a cock on close. There's a spring tension there, which I'm not be able to do on camera. They went to the standard bolt of the full rifle. They would go through several iterations of sights. They would go to a full length upper handguard. Sling swivels would be standard. They also started adding a mount in front of the magazine. The magazine was slightly updated with the biggest change. They finally got rid of the chain. Although they still only issued two mags per gun. And they put a secondary sling swivel there. Again, since it was supposed to be a one size fits all, I think the idea was well, there are four places you can attach swivels, meaning, uh, you know, Army, Navy, Cavalry, Artillery can kind of configure it. Also, a bayonet lug was standard. A new pattern here with the nose. And of course, it has a protected front sight with uh, ears pretty similar to the Cavalry carbines at least in theory and principle. The rear sight's also protected. And it's now a more modern style sight, both windage and elevation adjustable. But we have quite a few holdover features as well. One of the biggest, we still have volley sights. Yay! Because volley sets are fun. And here you can see a new safety pattern that's again fixed to the receiver, kind of like the early Lee Metfords. Although the caulking piece is kind of a transitional style. It um, is definitely a different shape. This is more of a round cylinder. This has more of a slab side, but it's rounded. So they are changing the caulking piece, but you can see it kind of evolving. Still have a trap door in the stock. And, of course, no provision under the barrel for any kind of rod. So, they started testing these in 1901, and, of course, people were immediately pissed off and disparaging of the new gun. Oh, it, it's not as light and handy as the carbine. It'll be too much for artillery and cavalry to handle. Too cumbersome. Oh, for the infantry, it, it's not accurate enough. It doesn't have the range. It has too short of a sight radius. There's too much muzzle flash. Too much noise. Too much, too much, too much. And oh my god, you got rid of the chain on the magazine. People are going to be losing their mags left and right. Um, yeah, just... Bleh. However... Those tend to be more of the armchair people. <laughs> people on the field, you know, units that were given these to try out in 1902, had mostly positive things to say. So a few last minute changes were made. And at the end of 1902, the pattern was kind of locked in. They were no longer making changes. And by 1904, it was in full adoption and started to be deployed. Also in 1904, the original carbine and rifle were officially removed from the production roster. And once these went into service, they proved quite good, but not perfect. They had some weak spots and uh, some failure points. Again, this is the Mark I. Their attempts to make a product improved version would lead to probably what you have in your gun safe. At the beginning of 1907, we get the short magazine Lee Enfield Mark III. But what about the Mark II? <laughs> well, starting in 1906, they took older 
Lee Medfords and Lee Enfields and re barreled and rework them to the new Mark I or maybe even Mark III standard and that's where Mark II was used converted old rifles the Mark III really just took all the advice from the field and tried to improve the gun still same barrel length same basic weight and dimensions they made a stronger handguard and stock thicker more rigid they improved the sight protectors up here making it easier these are very enclosed making sightings and that was a little difficult these flare out more to give a better view of the front sight so the same uh, bayonet lug went to a slightly new pattern of rear sight still windage elevation adjustable still have the mag feed cutoff interestingly the Merc 3 was the first one to have a standard issue mags by that I mean older ones Lee Medford's Lee Enfield's even the uh, Mark 1 Smiley's shorties the mag often had to be fitted to its gun starting with the Mark 3 they went to a mag that should pretty much be universal should be more importantly they went to a fixed receiver bridge that acted both to give strength why not but also mostly as a charger guide much more efficient system than this I don't think I need to explain why <laughs> stock was pretty well unchanged storage compartment disc and what have you they also changed the manufacturing process some making them faster easier and just generally speaking more efficient the Royal Small Arms Factory in Enfield, Birmingham Small Arms BSA, London Small Arms LSA all began production around the same time in 1907. In 1909, the Ishapur Factory in India would switch over to the new pattern. And in 1913, the Lithgow, or Lithgow, some people say, factory in Australia began infield production now you'll notice Canada does not have production that's because at this time there was a dispute about giving the Canadians license to produce and they ended up going with the Ross rifle and for that, you can check the playlist. We've done a couple of videos on the Ross. So, I considered putting it in this video and thought, nah, it's going to be long enough already. So, well before World War I, the improved Mark III is in service. And it was designed with the thought to going to a new Spitzer bullet. France had adopted it. A few years earlier so they knew it was coming it wasn't until 1910 that the spitzer cartridge for 303 was finally adopted and it was not a boat tail it was a flat a, a flat butted bullet early on later in life they would go to a boat tail and so the mark III was the one designed specifically for this now that 1910 was pretty early in this gun's production run so most of them were made with that already in mind the ones that were not were brought back in and given newly calibrated rear sights for the new Spitzer bullet and that's why I was saying earlier about these and sights some older guns SMLE Mark 1's were brought in and upgrade, given updated sights for the Spitzer bullet as well however still yet older guns like the Lee Enfield Emily, the MLE, the Longley, 
they tried using Spitzer in them, they just they just didn't work out well. So they used the original ball type ammo in those because some were still in service at the beginning of World War One. So with that, let's um, let's kind of diverge a bit and talk about a couple of different paths that were happening in the British military in the first and second decades of the 20th century. Nearly everyone in the British military recognized that the Boer War showed weakness and was there to teach them lessons. However, there was a split kind of in what lessons those were, <laughs> which ones they should do. The, the ones that saw a problem with the length, size, weight of the existing infield would lead towards this rifle here, the Mark III. However, some thought that that war showed fundamental problems with a 303 cartridge and the Lee bolt system. And to be fair, they have a bit of a point because both were originally designed for black powder. So, that's where we get this rifle here. The P14, or pattern 1914. This was a different take on how to make things better. They saw 1893 and 1895 model Mausers in Africa firing 7mm. They saw the range, flat shooting trajectory, accuracy, reliability, and they really wanted that. So they did. <laughs> they essentially copied the Mauser bolt action, even going to a cock on open, but added a few British flair, like this turned down dog leg bolt. They also kept their safety, although they, uh, they didn't move it to the right side. And they kept their stock and grip design. They also really wanted to challenge the 7mm 7x57 cartridge. And they came up with .267 British, which was basically a magnum round. It would also be rimless versus rimmed like the 303, so a more modern round. And this system was actually patterned and even kind of loosely adopted. It was the P13, the pattern 1913, and it went into field testing. Although not dissimilar to the Lee Metford years earlier, they found that the very hot round was wearing out barrels and leading to overheating. On the other hand, they did prove that this action was strong enough to handle it and that these were actually quite accurate guns. But the war got in the way. Could they have fixed the problems with the P-13? Yeah, probably. But World War I happened. So, to get it into production quickly, they reworked it to fire the standard 303 round, surmising that even though the round was obsolescent to them, the uh, new action, longer barrel and everything, and better sights, because now we have a rear mounted peep, we'll get to in a minute. Anyway, all the other advantages would still be a, a better gun. So, quickly reworked to become the P14, and initially Vickers in England was to produce these, but Vickers did not have any capacity to do so. And that's why the P-14 would end up being made in America. Winchester and Remington were originally contracted to make these, and to make sure they had delivered enough, Remington would set up a third factory, a subsidiary, at Eddystone. So they'd get all the tooling and stuff over, 
and by 1916 these would be in production. So yeah, let's take a closer look at this. The P14 has about a 26 inch barrel, so slightly longer than the Mark III. Has an overall length of about 46 inches, a little bit more, so slightly longer. But it's quite a bit heavier, about a pound heavier. It's just under nine and a half pounds, give or take. And that's again because it was designed for a Magnum cartridge. So it has a very heavy receiver, very reinforced bolt, and a very solid, this is a very durable stock. Has a full length wood handguard, protected the front sight, bayonet lug, swivels, Still have volley sights because that's still a thing that the British want. No feed cut off, but we do have a last round hold open follower, Mauser style. We do have a five round, or in the case of the 1917, a six round internal double stack mag, Mauser style. Like I said, we have a new tangent. Adjustable peep rear sight, much more effective for battle situations with a longer sight radius, and we still have a storage compartment in the buttstock. So why did this not take off? As we know today, the number three, with millions upon millions, some say 17 million, this was kind of second fiddle. Well, part of it was it wasn't made in the UK. And it took Remington, Winchester, and Eddie Stone quite some time to get up and running. It wasn't until 1916. Even then, after delays, they had problems. The parts were not fully interchangeable, especially between Remington and Winchester. And they found some minor function and mechanical problems, which actually led to the P14 Mark I Star at the end of 1916, which modified the extractor, the bolt lug, and therefore the end of the barrel slightly. And unfortunately, the older Mark I's couldn't be updated to the Mark I Star, but the change was minor enough; it wasn't critical. And they, they once they got up and running, <clears throat> they built these. They built over 1,200,000. And many got shipped to Britain. Not every single one, but most. And they were promptly put into storage. Because, in 1916, 1917, the SMLE had been well proven under fire in the trenches. It was a trusted rifle. Its previous naysayers had to shut up because it worked. Maybe on paper it shouldn't have worked as well as it did, but it did, and the British soldiers became quite fond of it. The P-14, on the other hand, kind of lost something when it went away from its Magnum cartridge. It also has half the ammunition capacity, and again, it weighs a pound more and is a slight bit longer and bulkier. It was more accurate, and these were used as kind of de facto marksmen, even sniper rifles. And that was kind of maybe their main claim to fame in World War I. But all in all, they mostly were just given to reserves and eventually would make their way to things like the Home Guard. And of course this would give birth to the American, or U.S., Model 1917 infield. Which again, I considered putting in this video, but were long enough. Suffice it to say, it was essentially this gun, but chambered for .30-06, and with a slightly different stock, and no fun little volley sights. So, a good idea. Some even call it the most advanced bolt action of World War I. I'm not saying they're wrong. It does combine a lot of the best features of several guns, namely the Mauser and the infield. But on the other hand, the infield over here proved to be 
plenty good enough and steps were taken during the war to further improve it both for mass production and for the soldier. In 1915 after a year of hardcore fighting and many losses on the front designers builders at Enfield and BSA started looking at ways to increase their production and use less resources. You know, originally they thought the Great War would last six months, maybe a year, but it was clear this was not happening. So, at the end of 1915, the SMLE Mark III Star appeared. And the very first company to start removing features was BSA. And the very first features they removed were the volley sites. This was a good call because trench warfare, unlike maybe some of the fighting down in Africa 15 years earlier, they weren't necessary and you could save a lot of resources, not just the sites themselves, but the mounts, the screws, the springs. You remove several parts. The next thing to go, a very short time later, was the uh, magazine cutoff. Again, you're removing a major part, also some springs and things, and it wasn't really needed. And that's why this rifle here is either a late Mark III or a very early Mark III star, because it has no volley sights, but it still has the mag cutoff. In 1916, Enfield and Ishapur would start adopting many of these shortcuts as well. The next thing to go would be our windage rear sight. There's a little wheel on it. Oh, it's on the other side. Sorry. Anyway, we got the windage rear sight gone. Again, it wasn't necessary. In fact, most of them ended up staked in place. This one might not even be. I'm not sure because they didn't want soldiers fiddling with them. And there were some other small changes to the, to the design simplifications, for example, with the caulking piece. We went to this round style here. There was kind of a carryover from the original Lee to the more slab side here. I think all around it's, it's easier to grasp and it's much simpler to machine. And here we have this rifle. The last company to really go to all the shortcuts was Lithgow in Australia. So you can find a lot of 1918 Lithgows with Mark III star features. Notice the rear sight, no uh, windage knob on it. They've also, on some of these at least, removed the sling mount here and just put a simple hook. They've also changed the front sight a bit, simplifying it. The holes, how they're drilled. But keep in mind, since the changes were implemented at different factories at different times, there will be a series of them. So you can't just say, well, a Mark III star does not have this or does have this. It's a progression. But it did allow Britain to really speed up production in World War I and build these in an enough numbers. And to be fair, Germany did the same thing with the Mauser. Maybe not quite as noticeably, but then it had fewer gadgets to get rid of in the first place. So by 1918 they were cranking these out. We had Enfield, LSA, BSA, Ishapur. They even tried what was called the pedal scheme which is basically putting these together at companies like SSA from parts sourced elsewhere but while a few were made and I've even had a few pedal scheme guns it was not successful. They didn't make that many. It just it didn't it didn't shake out. In 
and uh, by the end of the war, all Cosmine, all doubts were over about this gun's effectiveness. It was well liked, well respected, and in a lot of military service. It had proven itself in the trenches. You know, you read the kind of spurious thing about soldiers thinking they were up against machine guns. That, that's been proven just to be a propaganda thing. It's still fun though because this is a nice action. The uh, turn down bolt and the short throw and the uh, 10 round mag do have some advantages. And while 303 and the infield for that matter aren't exactly the most accurate, 303 because it's a rimmed round and whatnot, the infield because actually because of its design being a rear locking bolt back here much like the uh, Schmidt Rubin we talked about but it is strong enough for 303 it was a good enough rifle and a very British rifle for the Great War and it has become a uh, national icon like I said, the, the original Longleys and even a few carbines were serving in 1914, but these were very quickly pulled out of anything like frontline service by 1915 and pretty much officially retired out. However, they weren't officially, officially retired out until 1926, but for the past 10 years, they were basically just in, in stock pours, piles, and they, yeah. And Britain would continue to improve its uh, 303 bullet going through several other marks including different things like tracers and trying some armor piercing stuff as well. But finally we get to November, the end of the war, armistice, peace talks, Treaty of Versailles, and then we lay down our guns all quiet on the western front. And at that, let's take a break for tea and crumpets. Phew, we survived the war. Out of the trenches and Tommies are are going home and we're gonna get into the roaring 20s with booze and women and things. What kind of tea are you gonna have? I like Earl Grey. Caffeine, good. So yeah, comment in the chats below what your tea preference is. So then go make it, drink it, and then Resume the video, and we'll get in to the inner war period, and what was next for the Lee Enfield, because honestly, its story is just getting started. There are millions in the world, and they have a lot more to do in history. So... We've done the Treaty of Versailles, we're into the 1920s, we've done the Washington Naval Treaty. Budgets are cut, but the fine folks at Enfield still want to improve their rifle. Well, I hope you get some refreshments. And with that, we'll move on to the interwar period. And you'll have noticed I had not put away the... P14, even though it only saw pretty limited use, it did show the British something, and that directly led to this rifle, the SMLE Mark V, often called a trials rifle. The truth is a little more convoluted. They essentially wanted to try to squeeze more accuracy by going to this rear mounted peep sight but on the infield so they made this pretty fancy complicated version here it's very easy to adjust they also went back to the feed cutoff with peace time although the volley sets they're gone forever now the number three 
Still, the hang guard wasn't as strong as they would have liked. So, they did add a third band. Well, I mean, you have the front and the middle, and then, yeah. That was to try to give it strength, especially for bayonet use. And to make up for the band and the rear sight mounting. Notice how this has gone here. They also tried to give the receiver some lightning cuts. And they hoped not only to improve accuracy, but to continue to streamline mass production and make this cheaper to produce than at least the Mark III, if not the Mark III Star. And so they, they designed this around 1920-21, and the first ones were built around 1922. And they quickly realized not only was this not cheaper than the Mark III, it was actually more expensive because they were taking an existing design and really trying to modify it into something it wasn't. Between that year and about 1924, they would build between 20 and 22,000 of these, which seems like a lot for a trials gun. But the truth is, the budget. The government would not pay for brand new rifles, considering that they thought the army had enough, even though they weren't really crediting the fact that many of them were worn out from World War I. They said, now you got enough, make do. But they did allow for research and development. So they kind of pushed that as far as they could to get, you know, 20 some odd thousand new guns. And enough to at least equip some frontliners, and enough to really put these in the field and see if the extra cost was, uh, was worth it. The Mark V had better practical accuracy. By that I say, a peep sight like this in the rear does give a longer radius. and makes quick shooting in a combat situation faster, although as a target side it's not as good, perhaps. It's not really windage adjustable, just elevation. And it still had a lot of the shortcomings of a late 19th century gun with modern manufacturing techniques. So after the trial series, they kind of quietly ended it in and between 1930, excuse me, 1925 and 1930, they kind of a little bit went back to the drawing board in field to see what they could come up with. But soon the depression would set in, funding was limited. So not a lot happens. In 1926, the government kind of reclassifies the system. That's when guns like this become the number one. Number one Mark I, number one Mark III, number one Mark V in this case. The number twos would be training rifles. And number three would be the P14. They're still in service. At least they're still in stockpiles. And most of them are in great shape. And this is, like I said a minute ago, also when all the older guns were officially retired out. Just declared 100% obsolete. No, no way, no how. In 1930, a small production run was done at, at Enfield. Known as the number one Mark VI. They would build about 1,025. And they started off with the rear mounted peep but they went to a new heavier and free-floating barrel to try to squeeze that accuracy out. They were kind of deciding that lightweight wasn't as important as accuracy to them at this time. And it's from this, although it took a very long time, that our next rifle would uh, kind of grow out from. But before we go there, let's just mention that in 1939, really right before Germany declared war, well, okay, Germany invaded, and they, you, know, you know what I mean, the number threes were put through what was called the Whedon Repair Program. 
any rifles that had busted up stocks would be given new stocks. They would all be removed, relieved of their volley sights. And most of them would get a new phosphate parkerized type finish. And this was kind of a weed and repair standard. And these guns were intended to be issued to the Home Guard, although some were given to French allies, and some would make it down to North Africa and fight in the desert early in the war. Because, as usual, Britain's next rifle was a little late in coming. So the, uh, the number three was in service, if mostly second line, throughout World War II. And it was not officially declared obsolescent until 1947. And with that, let's move on to the second war. Yeah, the first one was supposed to be the war that ended all wars, but because of the Treaty of Versailles, it was really the treaty that ensured there would be another war. And even if the budget didn't allow for it, even if Britain didn't want it and wasn't ready for it, it was coming. And thus we come to the Lee Enfield number four. Like I said, they did the Mark VI in the early 30s. And they actually ended up, at least on some, using a very heavy barrel. They backed off from that a bit and kind of found the balancing point. But Britain was not ready for war, and so there were other priorities. It would not actually be until after war was officially declared that the number four would go into trials in late 1939 and then it would be kind of classified typed as the number four mark one and officially adopted in 1941 but at that time they were poised to make a bunch bsa opened a new factor factor there we go factory at shirley this is the m47 c code you also had Fezakerly and Maltme opening up in the UK. Now, interestingly, Australia and India did not switch to the new pattern. They continued making the number one Mark III. So, what do we have? Well, it's slightly longer and you can really see the P14 influence. We have a longer, heavier barrel, not a whole lot longer, about 26 and a quarter inches. It is heavier and they did what they could to try to free float it. We also have a new rear sight. Adjustable. Based on this, but made better for mass production. They also made the receiver more squared off. This meant there were fewer machining steps and it was easier to produce using modern tooling. It also meant it was stronger, more meat. Likewise for the uh, stripper clip guide, the bridge is now a whole single unit and just a stronger element. Of course, all these changes added weight. This was over 9 pounds. Not as heavy as the P-14, but a little over 9 pounds. And to help with the soldier, they went away from kind of the sword type or blade bayonet. Originally used to a very simple spike or short blade bayonet for the number 4. So that made the kit a little bit lighter. They also slightly changed the magazines, although they're pretty interchangeable, nevertheless. And with war going on, and the need for as many rifles as quick as possible, you know what that means. They're going to make changes in economies to speed up production and save resources. 
So with that, let's look at some of the changes made. One of the most noticeable parts to be impacted, in fact they used at least four versions, was the rear sight. Originally, they had a very fine machined micrometer adjustable rear sight. But very soon in England, they would go to this stamped sight, and there's several versions of it. And Canada would also have a stamp site. It was decided in 1940-41 that production would be undertaken at Long Branch in Canada and also under contract in the USA by Savage. And Long Branch would start making the number 4 Mark 1 pattern, but very quickly the two North American companies would go to the number 4 Mark 1 star. And now, a lot of people think it's the rear sight. Like this has just a simple two position rear sight here. That makes a Mark I star, but it's actually not that. It's this. The spring loaded little button. That was one of the changes done for the number four Mark I over the original Mark III number one to get the bolt out. Well with the Mark 1 star, the number 4 Mark 1 star, that's gone. Instead there's actually a cutout in the rail here for taking the bolt. And that small little change saved quite a bit of time. You save a full part, it's spring, retention, and that's what makes a number 4 Mark 1 star. However, plenty of other economies can be found. Some of them were even made with a two groove barrels. This one has the ribbed upper handguard. This one does. This one up here does not. Kind of looking at the muzzles. This one has the machined front sight. This one does two. Front sight protector I should say. And this one has the stamped also, the end caps are different. These are closed, whereas this one has an open end cap. This one has a stacking swivel. These do not. We'll see more stamped parts appearing. The bolt handle could have the hole in it. That was done just to save a little weight, maybe half an ounce, but it didn't have to be done, so a lot of them were made without it, like these. The trigger too, like this one has a flat faced trigger, whereas these have the ribbed trigger, as on earlier infields. Furniture wood could change. Several different types were used. For example, in North America, they used a lot of beech and birch. In Europe, they could use walnut or else. The rear sling swivels can vary. This one has like a narrow swivel. This one has a wide swivel. This one has a narrow. Butt plates could be brass or kind of a zinc alloy or even steel finish could be blued, phosphated, painted. They were just trying to get them out the doors. And of course each factory might do it a little differently. And of course today, keep in mind that many of these have been rebuilt and refurbished, so it's not always possible to know the original parts. But we know the original makers. And uh, yeah, the, uh, the factories in the UK, North America, cranked these out. But again, Australia and India did not. And uh, number three, number, or as I say, number one Mark III production was officially halted in the UK in 1940. However, very few had actually been built for years. And so this replaced it. Early in the war, you could see 
P14s or Mark III's, maybe even some Mark V's if they were needed. And even the original thousand or so number one Mark VI's, most of them were rebuilt into standard number four Mark I's. These just kind of slowly filtered in throughout 1942-43. And the number four was used by mostly the British and, of course, the Canadians. Although they got around into places like India. And a lot of people see the savage ones and kind of wonder, because they say U.S. property on them, that was a Lend-Lease thing. They weren't being made for American troops. I'm not saying no American troop in World War II didn't pick up an infield. I'm sure some did, but that wasn't the intention. But yeah, the World War II, number four, Mark I and Mark I Star. It's worth pointing out that in 1944, the bureau British government, the bureaucrats, again made a kind of a nomenclature change. Instead of using Roman numerals at the end, they went to an all Arabic. So instead of number four Mark I, it would have been number four Mark One. Again, bureaucrats doing the bureaucrat thing. But that does explain the, the naming system as we go forward after World War II. I want to stop and kind of talk here a bit about the gun. It does look different, but really, it's the same Lee action we've always had. Rear locking, cock on close, removable head, 10 round attaching mag. Even the stock hasn't changed much. And the receiver, while it's become more square with the number 4, it's not that different. Really, most of your changes are with your barrel and handguard to make them stronger and simpler to produce. It's amazing that this action, developed in 1885, thereabouts, was still having new versions introduced in 1940-1941 and still very much in production. And these would not even be the final versions, actually not by quite a bit, to be honest. So with that, let's talk about late war and post-World War II infield service. And here we have them flipped over. One nice thing about the cocky handle of the infield, it kind of works as a gun rest. You flip it up. <laughs> up on the top we have a physically Number four, Mark One. Here we have that long branch. Number four, Mark One Star. And down here we have what was once a number four, Mark One, and is now a number four, Mark One slash two. Like I said, in 1944, the British bureaucracy, the B, changed to full Arabic numerals. So the next version would not be the Mark II, but rather the Mark II. But it would not come until after World War II. They made a good number during the war. At first... It was kind of seen as a wartime expediency, much like the Sten gun. It's not as refined in the stock, even though the stocks are probably stronger, well, definitely stronger, than a number 1 Mark III. They don't have that elegance, the, the way the barrel sticks out, and definitely the bayonet arrangement. You go from a sword bayonet to kind of a socket spike, and then late in the war, a socket blade. And then the way the receiver is all squared off, but the better accuracy, quicker, easier to use sights, and just dependability won most soldiers over. Keeping in mind, by 1944-45, British soldiers are being issued with a bolt-action 
originally designed in the 19th century at a time when more and more countries are using self-loading rifles and even a couple, Germany mainly, select fire like the MP44. You know, you got these Brits going along and the, uh, the Americans have M1 carbines and even worse for the Brits, M1 Garands, obviously generations ahead. Even the Russians had the SVT-40, although by this time it was kind of gone. Now I haven't talked about the sniper rifle variants, that's just not what I collect, sorry. Number 4, Mark 1 T's. So, after the war. First off, Long Branch continued production. Wait, sorry, wrong one. <laughs> Long Branch continued production. They would not end it until the 50s. I've seen a few different dates thrown around. I think the latest I've seen is at least 53 or 54. Obviously, Savage would have stopped at the end of the war because they weren't for America. And uh, while they would stick with the number 4 Mark 1 star in Canada, they would do a little more refining, you know, nicer looking wood going away from some of the stamped parts they had to go to during the war to back to machined going to more adjustable rear sights as opposed to the little flip and interestingly Canada would not go to a brass butt plate later they would actually go to a blued steel versus the zinc alloy in Britain they would uh, can I either keep the adjustable stamp sights or install the machined micrometers as they went in for what was known as FTR which was a refurbishment upgrade program and during those times they would often pull off a lot of the you know wartime parts and put on nicer looking parts but it was kind of a done hapdash up until 1949 that's when the number 4 Mark II pattern was adopted and production would begin at Fazakerly in July of that year. And this really isn't a new pattern. It's more of a standardization of a peacetime standard. Standard standards. The machined rear sight became standard. They pulled off most of the stamped parts going back to machined and they usually installed them in new beechwood stocks and they went back to brass butt plates which they just seemed to enjoy about the only mechanical difference was with the trigger earlier ones the trigger would have been just hung as part of the trigger guard which is fine a little bit sloppy a little more loose wiggle back and forth but they decided to hang it from this extension of the receiver, this wrist area. And that just made it a little more stable, a little less slop. Give a more consistent pull. Not a big difference, but a small and probably appreciated one. Now there were purpose-built number 4 Mark IIs. These would all be from Physakerly. They would also take Mark Ones and update them. Making them into... Mark 1 slash 2s, like this one. And they would also take Mark 1 stars, updating them to Mark 1 slash 3. And this program of new rifles and refurbishing updating old ones would continue at Fazakerly until about 1955. It was done at a bit of slow, steady pace. The truth is, they didn't need the rifles, except for maybe, perhaps, you could argue during the Korean War, although they still had plenty. It was mostly a make-work program, giving British citizens something to do, and also updating hastily produced rifles made during the war to something of a respectable standard. If they were going to have a bolt action, damn it, they were going to have an attractive looking one, at the very least. And so the final rifle version of the infield in at least the UK was the number for Mark II. And we don't 
really know how many were produced in total, but estimates are around a million. Not bad considering these were only made for a few years, but they were turned out in half a dozen factories, so that'll do. Uh, Australia, let's go, never made the number four. They were licensed for the Mark III, number one Mark III. And, kind of ironically, Canada never made the Mark III. They only made the number four. But, there is of course one more major model to come out of England before it's all said and done. Now we come to the Lee Enfield, number five, Mark I. Often called, although it was never anything like official, the Jungle Carbine. Forty years after the original Enfield Carbine had been taken out of production and following the Boer War, they again thought it might be time to do that, to try the carbine. The number four, Mark I, had added back weight and a bit of length to the short rifle already at nine pounds which is just a little less than the uh, the long rifle started off with so and it's only a couple of inches shorter than the original long rifle to boot but it has a lot of advantages I'm not saying they went backwards it's definitely a superior gun but warfare was changing in the 1940s cavalry on horseback was no longer really the concern but mechanized troops, scout troops, and probably most of all airborne paratrooper troops were. And so for them the lighter, the shorter, the better. So work began in 1943 with testing on a shortened lightened number four carbine. And this is what they came up with. There are some very interesting prototypes and test models too. But in March of 1944, this was the pattern that was adopted, and then it was put into production at BSA Shirley and Fezakerly that year. And they, they were originally first handed out to airborne divisions. They saw some limited use in 1944, but they saw some major use in 1945 as British troops helped liberate Norway and Denmark. And this is a true carbine. In fact, it's the shortest in field we've seen today. It has an overall length of just 39 and a half inches. The barrel <laughs> is a little under 19 inches, but because of this giant conical flash hider, it's more like 21 inches or close to it. And weight, she's pretty light, which is about 7 pounds. They did all they could to save on weight. They used the thin pattern of trigger guard, which yeah, does appear on some number fours. They also used the hollowed out bolt handle, again on number fours. They went to a side sling mount in the back here. And that. The front mount's still below. They went to a shortened, especially on the top end. I mean, both handguards are shortened, but this one especially. Still have a bayonet lug, but it's a new pattern for the Mark V bayonet. Flash rider, of course. Protected front sight. And we, because we are a carbine and they're realistic, this rear sight only goes out to about 800 meters, or yards, I forget which. Whereas the number four goes out to 1,200 so, shorter rear range rear sight. It's funny, in the Boer War, a gun that couldn't get at least a thousand yards was considered a failure, and in World War II, 800 yards, meters, what have you, is pretty much maximum range. Again, just changing warfare. That said, we still have the Lee bolt system and Lee magazine. In most other ways, this is a number four just shortened so yeah these were in full production at two factories but 
much like with earlier leak carbines, it wasn't long before soldiers started reporting problems. And let's compare it with the infield carbine, the New Zealand again, why not, since they're more of a piece, both have bayonet lugs. The jungle is just a hair shorter, half an inch, maybe an inch. Maybe just a little bit lighter too, hard to say. They did all they could to lighten it. They added lightning cuts to the receiver. They also put some pretty major lightning cuts on the barrel under the handguard. If you are ever looking at one of these and are concerned it may be a fake, just pull off the handguard and look. The barrel will have lightning cuts. And uh, also if it's based on a number one Mark III or something, it's a fake. Australia did make some prototype number one Mark III carbines, but they're very rare and yeah, it's probably not what you're seeing. But a lot of US companies like Golden State made plenty of faux jungles out of number one Mark III's. So caveat emptor guys. Know what you're looking at. So they did what they could to remove weight from the barrel, the receiver, the bolt. Even the trigger guard, they also shortened the stock. Interestingly, some like this one have a metal cap on the end, and others just kind of the wood ends. Short upper handguard. And they try and help with what they knew would be bad recoil. They added a relatively thick rubber butt plate. It wasn't enough, not nearly, but they tried. That also meant this is one of the few infields without a trapdoor in the stock for its cleaning accessories. And it's kind of funny. They had very similar issues with this that they did with the original infield carbine. Much like with the original, soldiers liked that it was light, handy, and just kind of cool looking. But they claimed they had problems with accuracy. Now on the original carbine it was pretty much put down to the sights and the short barrel. On this one it was put down to a wandering zero. You can go back and forth in, in other videos we have about the validity of this, but it was certainly a common complaint. Also as with the original carbine, this one was felt to have too much recoil and even with this flash hider it had some pretty noticeable oomph. And keep in mind, the 303 that these were firing in 1945, a modern Spitzer boat tail bullet, very different from the round nose early 303 versions that would have been used in a carbine like this. So, I'm not surprised. Not one bit. Because of the complaints and because of new government in the UK in the end of the war they decided to halt production in November of 1947 so my gun here is a relatively late example from Physically I believe they would build about 250,000 just over 80,000 came out of BSA Shirley and just under 170,000 came out of Fizzakerly, meaning that Fizzakerlys are definitely the more common. But with only a quarter million made, this isn't exactly the most common gun anyway, because even if production ended in 1947, these went around. The British used them for a while, then they get handed off to allies like India, and so some of these come in looking pretty rough, and a lot of them eventually did see service in the... Uh, Pacific and tropical environments and well, you know what that does to metal. Now, as the British started to do late in the war and of course a lot after the war, they did give them a painted finish sunkerite, which does help a lot with protecting against rust. But it's not foolproof, of course. And with that, the last major version of the infield ended in the UK. There were plans to do a number 5 Mark II. It was to have 
a trigger hung from the receiver extension like the number 4 Mark II. It was also to kind of do away with some of the lightning cuts on the receiver. This was hoped to maybe check recoil a bit and maybe address that potential wandering zero problem. But again, that was a bit of a gremlin problem that was hard to replicate in a controlled test environment. Personally, it might have happened, but I think a lot of it was it's frickin' 1947 and they're trying to issue British troops bolt actions. And this is Britain we're talking about. They're supposed to be at the forefront. By 1947, pretty much everyone, including France, has a self-loading rifle. So I think it was just discontent with the gun. But it is cool for us collectors. And with that, in the end of World War II, and before we tackle Korea, let's have another break. How about uh, scones this time? So, what flavor, what kind of scone are you going for? What is one of your favorite snacks? Pastries? Post them in the comments. Why not? Yeah, we kind of covered uh, the infield. It trucked right along through World War II, and not just in England, but <laughs> a number of nations. They even roped America into producing rifles for them again during the war. And history kind of repeated itself a bit with the number five. And it's amazing that they were still producing these before, during, and after the Korean War. But of course, finally they would end production in most places, but not all. In fact, there were still a few variants, pretty major ones, left to be created. So... Let's get into the infield in the Cold War. And this is where the infield design saga kind of ends. Not in England, not even in the UK, but in India. Which is perhaps fitting the Ishapur factory was one of the earliest builders outside of the UK. And here we have their 2A1, which is based on their version of the number 1 Mark III, sometimes referred to as the Type 56, which is a further simplification of the base original gun there is one major difference. This is chambered not for 303 like every other one we've seen, but for 308. 7.62 by 51 NATO to be exact. And this required quite a few alterations, more than you might think. And it's also worth pointing out that all of these were purpose-built guns. They were not conversions. If there were conversions, they were just done early on for uh, like trials, testing, that kind of thing. So, you know, general specs are the same. It actually weighs just a little bit more than a standard infield. Nine some odd pounds. Same overall length though, same barrel. The changes are mostly internal. For example, of course, the bolt head and everything had to be reworked, the extractor, to work with the rimless or recessed rimmed round. And the receiver had to be made out of a much higher grade, more modern ordnance steel. The infield action was strong enough to handle 303, smokeless, but as it is, the steel originally used was just not strong enough 
to handle a steady diet of 7.62 NATO. So they went to stronger steel. It has other simplifications that you would expect from a late production Indian. For example, the simplified front sight, which kind of, or protectors, very straight, kind of harkens back to the number 1 Mark 1, <laughs> the original SMLE front sight in a way. We have a stamped front sling swivel and a stamped rear swivel. And, originally, on the first model, the 2A, we had a 2,000 yard rear sight, which is ridiculous. That's because of the better trajectory of 7.62 NATO. But the 2A1, though, they went to 800 meters, so from yards to meters, and a more realistic range. For the new round, if I can get it out, we have a new box bag. Has this kind of flared out plate with a takedown pin. They made both 10 and 12 round capacities, and I've never seen a reason why, aside from just they did. And who's to say what guns would get which? I don't know if I can get it in. This one's not terribly stiff, but doing it. There we go. I don't know why, but the mags seem to come in and out of these pretty easy. And they would either have had a blued or a painted finish. These were designed around 1962 1963 for the Indian Army, although they were meant mostly for the reserves, second line, auxiliary, backup use. This was following the. Uh, Indian, or Sino-Indian, or India's war with China, and they discovered they needed more guns. So it was always kind of meant to be a second line gun, but it did see active military service in the 60s. And it its place in history is that it was the last bolt-action gun, a new bolt-action model, to be adopted by a military for standard issue even if it was second line. Now that's not saying there haven't been sniper and other specialist rifles and also training and drill rifles since then. We're just talking about, you know, field use. But yeah, by 1963 the 2A was in production and then by 1965 it was superseded by the 2A1 here. And it's said that production lasted till roughly 1974 or 1975 with around a quarter million built, but India's records are a little mysterious even to this very day. Flipping her over as usual. It's pretty well an infield. Standard safety. One difference you can see there is a bolt installed on the side. This is to strengthen the stock for potentially heavier, more violent recoil. Simplified rear sight. And here's the other side. Still has the standard bayonet lug. And what have you. It's interesting that some sources report that while these were built as new guns, receivers, barrels, some of them were built with other parts from salvaged rifles, for example, stocks. Which actually does kind of gel because I've seen some 2A1s that were imported here that had very just brand new bores, but the stocks look like shit. <laughs> and it kind of makes sense. <clears throat> Again, there's also the, the magazine issue Y12, Y10. And yeah, these were in second line use for a very long time, several. Several decades. We got a little splinter in the wood there. Like where a caulking handle hit it. Anyway. Although they're officially out of army service now in India, they still are carried by Indian police and maybe other security. A bolt action gun, but it is firing a modern 
cartridge. And uh, it's a cartridge we can get today. Quite a quite a bit of fun. And since these were purpose built to fire 7.62 NATO, there's no real danger in, in doing so. Now some 308 may be problematic. So make sure you know what you're firing. There were a few other conversions to 308 done in, for example, the UK and Australia, but not ever done on this scale. And again, not done for just general issue. So this does have an interesting place in history. There are a few odd things about this gun, though. For example, this here magazine and its floor plate is reminiscent of something. And <clears throat> this butt plate, while it does have a trap door, it too is different style. Much easier to open, for one thing, than a standard infield. <laughs> and that's reminiscent of something. What could it be? And here at the end, let's do a bonus rifle. Why not? I will always drag out the British L1A1 SLR whenever there's a halfway decent excuse. To be fair, these were made by the Royal Small Arms Factory Enfield, as well as Birmingham BSA and Fizzakerly. And as you know, this is the Commonwealth version variant of the famous Belgian FN FAL firing 7.62 NATO. Now, I've done a lot of videos on the FAL, and this one's long enough, but I thought we would discuss it as it pertains to the infield, because the infield hung on for a very long time, in most cases through the 1950s. And it wasn't until the FAL came about that it finally was replaced. In 1954, Canada was the first to purchase a large number for field trials. Britain would follow soon after. And Australia would be the last of the major three in 1959. Britain would begin looking at these in 1954, adopt it in 1957 and thus officially retire the FAL, excuse me, the infield. In Australia and Britain, it's known as the L1A1, and in Canada, it was originally the C1, later the C1A1, and there was also a select fire variant, the C1D, C1A1D. That's what's interesting. They finally get away from a bolt action, and you'd think they would go to a select fire gun, but they did not. The SLR stands for self-loading rifle. These were safe, semi, or repetition as the British called them, only. Australia and Canada did have a select fire version, the L2A1, C2, C2A1, but Britain did not. They just did the L1A1. This rifle is actually just a smidge longer than the number one Mark III. It's about 45 inches. It has a barrel, if you include the flash hider, of a nearly 22 inches, because it's a very long hider. <laughs> and it weighs about 9.5 pounds, so it's not any smaller or lighter. But it is, of course, self-loading, and it feeds from detachable. 20 round mags, inch pattern. That's actually what I was pointing out with the Ishapur. If you look at the base of the mag here, you can see a commonality. Lengthwise, they're actually about the same, although the front is more narrow in the 2A, 2A1 mag to accommodate the infield receiver. Also, the feed lips and all that at the top are very different. India did produce a version of the FNFAL L1A1 known as the 1A1 but this was unlicensed 
they worked on it around 1960 and um, it mostly had L1A1 features but it, they did throw some Belgian so metric styles in for good measure so that's why when they made <clears throat> the uh, the 2A, 2A1 for second line use it didn't seem so crazy and they used even a few of the same parts mostly the butt plate is the same from their 1A1 and uh, this gun here so yeah throughout Britain, Canada, Australia this is what replaced the infield also in other countries like New Zealand Malaysia like I said India pretty much everyone who was still using an infield would end up going to the FAL and you know these are called the inch pattern they have their own features they have a unique bayonet lug, flash hider typical FAL gas system short stroke folding charging handle folding rear sight folding trigger guard if you need to enlarged mag release enlarged change lever selector and one thing they did that was kind of interesting the metric FAL, the Belgian pattern holds open on the last round but I guess because the British were never really used to that because of the infield when it came time for the L1A1 they disabled the automatic feature of the hold open making it a manual only device so you can press up on it and hold your bolt open but otherwise it's not going to do anything now to be fair originally these had wood furniture walnut I believe but then they went to this nylon fiberglass stuff in the late 60s 70s called Miranil it's very good furniture so most of the ones in British service would get get rid of their wood and go to this which does give it a much more modern look than the uh, wood wood like this flipping her over one thing that Britain was a bit ahead of the curve with with their own one one is they started issuing optical sights pretty early on the suit being the most the Trilux type that's why the rear sight folds it's also one of their tabs in the back of the cover. Well, one of the reasons. There's a couple. So even though it was expected to be semi-auto only, they were trying to make up for that by having an optical side is, if not standard issue, at least common issue. 20 rounds. And they figured that 7.62 NATO was powerful enough to get the job done even, uh, even as a semi. Plus a bayonet. These would uh, serve Britain and places like North Ireland and the Falklands. They would serve Australia and New Zealand and the Vietnam War. They would serve India throughout several border skirmishes in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And uh, production would continue well into the 80s. Now it seems like in Britain most of the rifles were built in the late 50s to early mid 60s and then after that they just took what they had and uh, kind of refurbished them which makes sense because by the 70s and 80s we're starting to see uh, a decrease in military spending in some cases and also the desire to replace this with a new 556 five, gun and Britain had always been enamored with the bullpup even trying to adopt one before the L1A1 unfortunately what they ended up adopting was the L85A1 why they did not go with the Steyr AUG like New Zealand or Australia or the M16 M4 like Canada I don't know well I do know why but you know what I mean <laughs> what a call but that's a story for another day. In reality, these were officially replaced in 1985. Although it wouldn't be until after the first Gulf War that all were pulled from service and they tried replacing them with L85A1s. But those were problematic.
And of course, by this time, all the infields were long out of service, except for training and some marksman type rifles. But yeah, it took a rifle like the FAL to finally dethrone the infield, which is understandable because it's one of the few guns that was produced in anything like the same kinds of numbers the infield. No one really knows how many have been made, but it's well over 10 million, maybe as many as 20 million. Usually 17 to 17 and a half million is a commonly quoted number. So we can go with that. Why not? Well, we made it through. As usual, let's uh, get on with the wrapping up. Hey, we made it through another one. And definitely a long one. Told you it'd be a theatrical length motion picture or the slow motion picture. <laughs> Being serious, I hope this does kind of put the infield's evolution into perspective. I tried to balance going into detail with not bogging it down too much. I mean, we are covering nigh on 100 years of history here. There are 13 guns in total. Number fours. You know, in the beginning, I really preferred the number one Mark III look. It is the classic infield. But the number four has really grown on me. And the 2A, 2A1, it's just neat. They actually put a good bit of effort into designing this. And they probably really didn't have to. But it gave them an inexpensive and trusty second line gun. And a gun to give to like police and other allies like that. And they did a good job with it. So, yeah. And again, I don't cover sniper rifles or trainers in this because we're, we're plenty long without them, for that matter. Didn't really get into bayonets either. But I couldn't resist putting the SLR in. It definitely, even though it's not a Lee Enfield, there's a bit of that same spirit, I'm not going to lie. But with that, I think we have wrapped things up. Like any good motion picture film, we'll roll credits and all that. <laughs> if you could, please like, share, and subscribe. Please do feel free to comment below. Maybe your favorite infield or favorite infield story. Or just the type of tea or scones you prefer. Or heck, how about favorite British author? All things British, chat. And if you'd like to help support the channel, because videos like these do take a day or more to make, check out the link to our Patreon page. You can find our rewards and all that then and there. Alrighty, folks. With that, I will let you go. This is Misha. And also, on behalf of Jay, we will both catch you very soon next time. What are you still doing hanging around here? Wasn't two hours enough?
Get, get out of here. Go. Go. Go call a friend. Or, I guess if you don't have a friend, go, go play Minecraft? Is that what kids do now? I'm not sure. Really? Still, still here? Okay, fine. <laughs> God save the queen. Actually, during COVID times, that's probably a legit concern, considering she's like 98. Want a cat? Free cat? Send me a postcard. I'll mail you a cat. Your choice of colors. Free cat. Well, you, you can't get a post credits scene because we really don't have credits. That was just a joke. Not a good joke. But a joke. I mean, what do you want? You're not gonna leave, are you? So I, but what does he want? All right, fine. One more. The Sterling AR-180, which absolutely doesn't fit in an infield video, which is why I didn't put it in the video, but you're still here. And this is just a cool gun. And this is one that's been kind of more focused on recently because of the Brownells BRN-180. But back in the day, these were the cheap, these were the poor man's SP-1, poor man's AR-15, and these were kind of the AKM before the AKM was available here. And the story of why these were built in England is quite interesting and for a full video. But as you know, the AR-18 is the select fire version, the AR-180 is the semi-only. And they produced both from the outset. This was designed by Armalite after they sold Colt the patent to the AR-15. Then they began working on a gas piston, 7.6 tornado gun known as the AR-16. Well, the 223 version, which it was mostly referred to back then in the 60s, became the AR-18. And uh, they first started drying these out in 1964 and production began around 1969 at Costa Mesa, California directly under Armalite. What made these guns unique? They had the short stroke gas piston, they had the recoil system in the upper receiver which allowed for a buttstock. They used modern polymer or I should say modern kind of Bakelite style like the AR but unlike the AR they still used forgings and stuff. It was made from stamped and welded steel. Pretty much everywhere. Even some of the trigger components are stamped steel. Also, it has an 18 inch barrel. Pretty lightweight. And it is not chrome lined to save on money. Still is threaded with a flash rider. Still has a bayonet lug. Has basic front sight takes a pretty standard sling, has an adjustable rear sight, and, kind of unique, it had a uh, scope mount on top for a QD system. Of course, this, this was way before Picatinny. And it has an ambidextrous selector. Flip it over.
you see it is on this side and actually a lot like modern say Colt or Dimico selectors it's shorter on this side and they did that so when the stock was folded you could still access your fire mode maybe not as convenient but it was there here's the windage knob for the rear sight to fold the stock there's just two spring loaded buttons here has a folding dust cover not dissimilar to the AR has a reciprocating charging handle that's up swept the mag catch is on the right and is a little different style as are the magazines now originally Armalite mostly rocked it with some 20 round straight mags but Costa Mesa really couldn't produce many of these he only built 40, 100 or so AR 180s and 1100 or so AR 18s. They contracted with Hawa in Japan to build more so around 1970, but this didn't last long, only a few years because of the Vietnam War and other things. This was against the Japanese Constitution, so Hawa delivered fewer than 40, excuse me, 44,000 AR. 180s. But in 1975, give or take, a new deal was struck with our friends in Dagenham, England at Sterling Arms. And they would produce the AR-18 and AR-180 under license from Armalite. It took them a little while to get the production line up and running because this was pretty different. Sterling was mostly known for pistols and submachine guns like the Sterling L2 or the Patchet before it but by 79 they were cranking out guns and they would actually be by far the biggest producer they would turn out about 12,300 most being the AR-180 because that's what most markets had they did try to get military and police interest but it was pretty, pretty, pretty small, pretty limited. So the semi-auto was the thing, and most were sent over here because military-style rifles like these, even in the 80s, weren't allowed in a lot of nations. Now people will point out that these were used by the IRA. They were, but those were not Sterlings, at least most of them. You might think they would be, but they really weren't. They seem to have been majority Hawas. They were smuggled in, and it probably seems like the IRA used them a lot, but really it was the same few rifles being used over and over and over, you know. I mean, they had, they had a good number, but yeah, not as many as one might think by looking at the news. And it was interesting because these went up against the British L1A1, and in some ways gave the Irish an edge. This is smaller, lighter much easier to conceal which was important given their situation and 223 versus 308 I mean you know pros and cons but this did along with many other factors inspire Britain to finally switch over to a modern gun unfortunately that modern gun was the L85 one other thing the magazine like I said originally 20 rounds was the norm but Sterling developed a 40 rounder they can also work in an AR-15 and these are made of steel and they're curved and they actually have a very good reputation and a lot of times the Sterling AR-180s were kind of poo-pooed but in some ways they made the best gun from a durability standpoint they added additional weld points they thickened the metal in a few small areas And at least the first 5,000 or so had this black paint finish, which many consider stoving, and I guess it is. I like to think of it as like budget sunkerite, because at least it has that British military vibe going on. And, you know, uh, in the physical sense, it matches the uh, the L1A1. But that's just me. Your mileage may vary. See the stock locks in here. 
with this little uh, little latch. These are really neat guns. They they are not without flaws. They have many, but they could have been developed. And in fact, they were. Many nations looked at this, and while they did not adopt the AR-180, AR-18, they said, "Hey, that's a great idea." And so, really, a whole generation was born thanks to this design. You can look at all the guns that were influenced by it. Again, the L85. If you look at the bolt carrier group in an AR-18, it's actually very similar to the bolt carrier group in an L85, as is the underlying operating system. So with that, I will say this. We've never had a semi-auto L85 in America. This is the close, closest we ever got and probably ever will get. So that's why, even though most people look for the Costa Mesas or the Hawas, I looked for a Sterling, and specifically a painted one. I just, I think it's kind of neat that it was made in England. And this is one of the last military guns we got out of England. In fact, we never really got that many to begin with, come to think of it. And they pretty much came from Sterling. Just a part of that lost era. Plus, hey, the AR-18 was in Terminator, so well, there's that. <laughs> so there, you get a post-credits peek at one more British gun. Back in the day, for a long time, people kind of didn't... They really didn't command a ton of money. But, uh... These days, they really have become popular. There was definitely a cult following, which explains why Brannells did reproductions of these. Of course, Eagle Arms, the new Armalite, tried the AR-180B, but that's a story for another day. Well, if you've remained this far, well, we might do a retrospective video on the AR-118, 180. Why not? It's been a while since we brought it out. It's not the most enjoyable gun to shoot is the trigger kind of but it has a lot of cool points alrighty guys for real this is the end I mean you can stay here if you want but I'm going to bed I do appreciate it sincerely and again if you'd like to help support the channel check out the link to our patreon or if you could, at least like, share, and subscribe. And also, we love when people comment. So, with that, I will catch you very soon next time. Yeah, for real, I'm, I'm gone. Turn off the video. There we go. Do your thing. Do, do, do. Okay.